Hi, so batteries are one of the hot topics of our time, with lots of people interested in either building one themselves or inventing a new one because they're super expensive and not really that good for the price you pay for them. And it occurred to me that I do an awful lot on batteries. And it might be interesting to know how I go about doing that. What is that process that I use? And then if people are wanting to create their own battery, maybe the process will help them. Now, I talk a lot about standing on the shoulders of the past. So the first step I do is have a look at something interesting that happened in the past. Now, we all know about the lemon battery. If you get a lemon and you stick in some copper and some zinc, you'll get about a volt out of it, something like that. And it will run an LED. Now, that is the famous Charles battery, but it's based on something called the Daniel cell. And the Daniel cell was invented in about 1836. And what it is, is copper and zinc together in an electrolyte. The electrolyte that's demonstrated in school chemistry is copper sulfate and zinc sulfate. The original cell used sulfuric acid. So it's a mixture of copper sulfate and sulfuric acid in the bottom and pure sulfuric acid in the top. And of course you have to keep them apart. And the way they kept them apart at the time was by the use of a porous pot, like a plant pot. A plant pot is an unglazed ceramic, so it is porous, but it does stop ions travelling through to a degree. So the use of a ceramic pot or ceramic cup to contain one element was what Danielle did. Now, it wasn't long before they realised that lugging huge amounts of sulfuric acid around was a pretty scary thing to do, and so they changed it. They changed the zinc sulphate and copper sulphate. Now, these are batteries with a long history. They were used until about the 1960s, believe it or not. All you have to do with them is recreate the environment of the lemon, which is pretty easy to do. So, there's a glass and there's a bit of copper cut from some water pipe, and you stick that in there. Then we grab ourselves some copper sulphate and pour a whole load of copper sulphate in the bottom there. Now, the benefit of something like a Daniel cell are the chemicals used are relatively innocuous. I mean, copper sulphate is root kill, so in toxicity is a relative term, but they're certainly not as toxic as concentrated sulfuric acid. Once you've done that, you add some distilled water to a level. And in our pot, we have a bit of zinc. We pop the zinc in there. Add some more distilled water there. And then just give it a little time to diffuse and react because that zinc will be changed into zinc sulphate by the action here. And we clearly have an excess of copper sulphate right there. So after we've given that a little bit of time to uh, react, we'll actually get a working battery. And if you don't want to wait for it to react, Put either sulfuric acid, if you're feeling brave, or zinc sulphate in there instead of distilled water, and it'll work pretty much straight away. But by about now, we should get a little bit of power out of that. And there we go, running that motor. And it'll continue to run that motor until all those chemicals are eaten up. OK, granted that was a little feeble, but it was certainly a great improvement on the voltaic pile that came before it. And we're an inventive lot, aren't we? So it didn't take long for people to start looking at this and making improvements. And of course, the early easy improvements are surface area. So the amount of current you get out there is directly related to the surface area that can react. So lots of granules, crow's feet designs, all that sort of stuff came out. Now, the other thing is this pot it actually creates a high resistance. So a really interesting one was the Bird battery. Bird actually put a layer of plaster of Paris between the two to act as a separator. Now, it's just a variety of the Daniel cell, but that idea will come into play later. Now, the real guys who took hold of this were at Lalande and Chaperon in 1880. And what they did was ask themselves, OK, that works with acid. What about if we stick some alkali in there? So instead of using uh, zinc sulfate, which is an acid salt or sulfuric acid, let's try a bit of potassium hydroxide. And that was kind of the next step forward, and it was called the Lalande cell. Now, it doesn't actually work particularly well with copper, but you might have noticed that the copper was covered in a red coating. That red coating is copper one oxide, because copper oxide comes in two forms. It comes as this stuff, Nice beautiful red powder, which is copper 1 oxide, and copper 2 oxide is a black powder. This stuff actually can be got as pottery glaze, and you can see I've got about 2 kilos of it here, so it's really easy to get hold of as pottery glazes. But Lalande used that, 
And Edison took the Lalande cell and developed it further into a primary cell that he sold for his telegraph and his phonograph and that sort of thing, because it was powerful in, in these terms and lasted for a really long time. Now, of course, there were problems with it, hey? I mean, one thing, it's a big pool of water, and that's annoying when you're trying to move it. And the other thing, it's prone to self-discharge. But perhaps the worst thing is that it couldn't be recharged. Now, what we've done is we've looked at a venerable battery, we've followed the history through to a point where it's been developed, but still doesn't quite meet our needs. So, what would you want to know? Well, what you would want to know is, can that cell be recharged? Is there some arrangement where we could make it rechargeable. And we could wildly guess at that, and we could try different things, or we could do something that is accessible to us that has never been accessible before, and is absolutely awesome. Now, when I was at university, if I wanted to do this stuff, I would go down to the chemical abstracts, collect the papers and the patents, and then every sort of three or four months, take a trip to either London or Leeds to read those papers. And I can assure you, it was a nightmare. But right now, we have this thing. We have the internet, which opens up that massive amount of research. I mean, you've got Google Patents, you've got eSpace.net, all allow you to search the patent database and get those patents up and read them to find out who's doing what and what's been put forward. There is one issue with patents, and that is they're not 100% truthful all of the time, so a little bit of interpretation is quite often needed. But if you do a straightforward Google search, you'll find an awful lot of information in something as simple as Wikipedia. Wikipedia will give you an awful lot of this stuff, what the developments were, how the developments have gone forward. But the real one that you need is Google Scholar. So we just go into a Google search, type in Google Scholar, click on it, and now we're in a separate database that searches all those research papers. Now, some of the papers are behind paywalls, some of them are freely accessible, and always the supplementary information is available. So if I click in there, put in there something like the Lambda cell, click on it, then I get this papers that have been pulled up. Here, we've got the free ones you can read, telling you that they're free. And we can click on a paper, doesn't really matter which paper it is, to be honest. Here we've got the DOI, which is the uh, Document Originating Index Number. All of them are done by that. And then here, sometimes on the page on this side, sometimes on that side, it'll tell you where the supplementary information is. You click on that, it'll pull it up and you can have a read of it. That supplementary information quite often contains experimental results, so you can have a look at what the latest research is and what they've been doing. So, what did we do here? Well, we had started in the past, had a look at the developments in the past, then we had a search on this incredible tool available to us to see what the latest developments were. So after about 10 minutes of searching, and I'm not joking, it was about 10 minutes, I came across this paper, which is rechargeable alkaline zinc copper oxide batteries. And they're addressing those questions that we want addressing. How can we make it rechargeable? How can we slow down the self-discharge? And how can we make it more handleable than a wet battery? So this paper, actually, was uh, written in 2021, so it's an up-to-date paper. And what they decided to do was to take this stuff, the copper oxide, and use that to make the cathode, mix it with a bit of graphite for conductivity, and add wonder ingredient X. Wonder ingredient X is bismuth trioxide. You stick a bit of bismuth trioxide in there and apparently it does some marvellous work. And on the anode side, zinc metal powder and some zinc oxide. So we now have our battery. Now we could make this up and just replicate what they've done here for peace of mind. But I tend to believe, correctly or wrongly, that most academic papers are not lying through their back teeth, which is different, of course, to patents where you have to be a bit more circumspect about them. So they've done that. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned the guy called Bird. And incidentally, for all the comments later, don't forget the word. The word is Bird. Bird, Bird, Bird. Bird is the word. So if you feel like commenting, I hope I've beaten you to it. <laughs> but don't forget Bird. And this is the inventive step. And they're usually not that great. I liked what Bird did, so the question is, my mind is, if we had some of this stuff, Plaster of Paris, 
and make the anode and the cathode with the plaster of Paris, are we going to get a battery that is an even further improvement on this? So again, looked at the past, saw the developments, saw the problems we had, did a search for the relevant latest data and uh, papers, and then had to think about how we could improve it from there. That's the process that we've gone through. Anyway, let's make up this battery. So in the yellow pot, I've got my stuff to make my cathode. Now, the weight percentages are 55% by weight copper oxide, 10% by weight bismuth trioxide, and 30% um, by weight graphite. Now, obviously, they're weight percentages, so you put 55 grams, 10 grams, 30 grams, or equally. Uh, 27 and a half grams, 5 grams, 15 grams, or equally, you can double it. But anyway, those are the weight percentages for that one. There's a bit of water in there to make it into that paste. In this one, I've got zinc metal powder and zinc oxide, and it's 10% by weight zinc oxide and 83% by weight zinc metal powder. Now, what we're going to do to that is use Bird's adaptation and a bit of plaster of Paris. I have no idea how much plaster of Paris to put in there. What I'm going to do is a 20% by weight percentage and see how it holds up. If it's a bit fragile, well, I'll have to make the whole thing again and increase the powder content. If it's nice and strong, I'll make the whole thing again and decrease the powder content until I get that point at which there's enough strength from the plaster of Paris to hold the electrode together as a briquette, but not so much as it takes up too much weight. Now, incidentally, um, Bird's development of the copper oxide battery actually wasn't used much, but he did notice that copper metal was forming in the plaster of Paris, and Bird is considered to be the father of electroplating, which I thought was really interesting. Bismuth trioxide actually is a bit of a wonder chemical for this sort of stuff, so if you want to stabilise a manganese dioxide cell, for instance, bismuth trioxide is the thing to use. It's also been used in lead acid cells for improving the life of lead acid. So a very interesting compound, and that's what we're using here. Now, I'm using the red copper oxide, copper one oxide, because it's closer to the Lalande cell. But you can, according to the research paper, also use the black copper oxide. So the black copper oxide would be really easy to get, like I say, from a pottery store. If you use the red copper oxide, you've obviously got less oxygen, so you'll need to adjust the weight percentage. But what I'm going to do now is stick some plaster of Paris in there and give it a test till we get a briquette. We need a current collector. Because we're using potassium hydroxide, or rather we're going to use potassium hydroxide as the electrolyte, we need something that's stable in the hydroxide. So nickel is obviously going to be your first choice because that's the one that everybody uses in uh, alkali environments. doesn't rot, so they use a lot of it. You could try copper and zinc. I don't quite know how that would work, but what we're going to use is uh, carbon black filled high density polyethylene. So first effort, I mixed in 20% plaster of Paris and then I put it onto the uh, backing here, the carbon backing, using this. It's just a square of plastic with a hole cut in it and just wiped it on. And it gave me an electrode. So we've got an electrode now, and this is the zinc electrode with a carbon black filled HDP backing to it. And that's going to make my cell. Now obviously what I need is a separator and an electrolyte. In the original paper, they uh, basically used cell guard, wrapped it up and stuck it in a vessel and filled it up. And I've got here 45% by weight potassium hydroxide. We're going to try mixing up some plaster of Paris, putting the plaster of Paris on there, sticking that one on top, and again, letting the whole thing set. The idea being that we have a solid cell, but we have a KOH electrolyte. I'm going to give that a go and see what happens. Just to give you a better view of this, there's our contact, which is the aluminium. If I peel that off, there we go. There's our carbon black that we're using to interpose between the contacts. So that's the current collector, remember. And if you look right there, that's the zinc oxide. Then this white one is the potassium hydroxide filled plaster of Paris. This top one here is obviously the copper. So we can put that back on and then our other contact and we've got our battery back. Now it's pretty cool actually. This you could imagine, I can imagine, making solid briquettes of this and you would have a solid state battery. So there it is, our solid plaster of Paris Daniel upgraded cell. So remember, these are our carbon black filled HDPE. Then we've got a layer of this stuff, which is plaster of Paris uh, copper oxide. 
Then we've got a layer of plaster of Paris mixed with potassium hydroxide. Then we've got a layer of this stuff, which is the zinc oxide mixed with plaster of Paris. And then another layer of the carbon black filled polyethylene. For our contacts, we're going to use these sheets of aluminium. So if I pop that sheet on there, and here's our little motor. Pop that on the other side. And there we go. Our motor is now spinning actually a lot more powerfully than the original Daniel cell that we did. It's still 1.1 volts, uh, but it'll run for absolutely ages. And this one is rechargeable, which is pretty cool. So the point of the video is not to make that battery. The point of the video is to show you what kind of processes I go through when I'm looking at this. So we've gone right the way back from the original Daniel cell all the way through some of the developments that we read about. We've had a look at the newest stuff, incorporated bismuth oxide, and then taken it a step further by using Bird's method of chucking in some plaster of Paris. Now, clearly, there's a lot of work to do on something like that. I mean, we don't know what the energy density is particularly, so we'd have to measure the energy density. And then there are other improvements we could make. We could make structural improvements. I mean, I just slapped that on a bit of plastic. It might be really cool to make briquettes and have those briquettes with some metal mesh in the center of them. But still, a ton of things to be able to do with that to improve that beyond that. But I thought that was really uh, worth sharing and certainly a very interesting battery. After all, it is solid state. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you very much for watching. Oh, and please remember to like and subscribe.